Okay, let's uh, uh, try and make a, uh, let's try and make a, a start. First of all, thanks very much for, for coming. My name is uh, uh, Dimitris Papadimitriou. I'm the uh, the director of uh, the uh, Manchester Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. I can recognize some very uh, familiar faces here. For those of you uh, who haven't yet been to one of our events, let me uh, remind you that the uh, center brings in um, um, expertise on all things European from a, a, a cross-disciplinary uh, uh, um, uh, perspective uh, from uh, different schools uh, uh, within uh, the University of Manchester and also from uh, the uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, the, uh, the School of Law has been one of the um, constituent uh, uh, um, stakeholders of the centre and uh, has been uh, very uh, supporting uh, uh, ever since. So, as you can imagine, uh, uh, in the year of Brexit, the centre has been uh, uh, very busy. Um, we have uh, held a number of uh, high-profile events this year. Uh, the last one was with the uh, four uh, um, uh, mayoral candidates for uh, uh, Greater Manchester just uh, last, last month. Uh, but uh, today we have an even better event. Uh, because I am uh, uh, delighted to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Rodney um, uh, Brazier uh, uh, here with you um, today. Uh, Professor Brazier is, uh, um, as many of you will know, one of the country's most distinguished uh, uh, constitutional uh, lawyers. With a very long and distinguished uh, uh, career, uh, the author of uh, uh, many uh, uh, books and articles that deal with uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the reform and the practice of uh, 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 British uh, constitutional law, uh, uh, the code of uh, um, uh, the ministerial code, and uh, over the years has uh, uh, provided terrific service and leadership to, uh, to this university. But uh, broader than this, of course, he has provided uh, uh, very expert uh, uh, advice on uh, a number of uh, uh, high-profile institutions, including uh, the House of uh, uh, Commons. And uh, in 2013, he, was, uh, 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 he became a member, let me get this right, a member of the Royal Victorian Order, which is very important, by the way, for those of you who don't have a British uh, background like me. <laughs> uh, uh, this award is uh, uh, um, uh, normally um, uh, presented to people who have uh, delivered uh, very um, important advice to the royal household uh, uh, and to the British monarch. So um, we have someone here who knows British constitutional law very, very well. We won't, of course, ask him what is the Queen's opinion on Brexit. We wouldn't be uh, so rude. But uh, uh, the fact that uh, um, we have such a distinguished uh, a constitutional, uh, British constitutional lawyer uh, at the center of European studies is very interesting in itself. I mean, I had one told me a few years ago that uh, uh, the center will be hosting on the anniversary of the declaration of the uh, Schuman uh, uh, Declaration 67 years ago. A British constitutional lawyer, I thought that would not really attract a good, uh, a good crowd. But of course, the, uh, the politics of Brexit, the referendum itself, the run-up to the activation of uh, uh, Article 50, and the uh, um, uh, very interesting constitutional, and not only constitutional, and political uh, implications of uh, uh, post-Brexit uh, Britain make these two rather uh, separate uh, uh, discipline not so separate anymore in this uh, uh, country. So um, as uh, um, I guess uh, um, with all of you, we are delighted uh, to have you here uh, today. We are here to learn from you and also uh, uh, to uh, help for you to help us uh, understand better uh, how can we navigate this uh, uh, post-Brexit uh, uh, landscape and uh, what it means for uh, uh, the British uh, uh, constitutional law, but of uh, British politics as well. So uh, thank you very much for agreeing to do this uh, lecture and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to give this lecture uh, just a couple of warnings, if I may. First of all, I have a slightly sore throat, and I am worried that towards the end of my two-hour address, I might get rather croaky, uh, so please bear with me. Second point I want to stress is that I am not an expert in EU law as such, as a discipline. Uh, my limitations are from the British constitutional law uh, end. Uh, a bit worryingly, I've noticed that this uh, has been advertised as the centre's flagship event. Um, when I finished, you might think, well, 
if that's the flagship lecture, how bad can the others be? Um, anyway, at times I'll say some things which are reasonably well known to you, but they might not be so familiar to others, so please bear with me. One of my arguments will or might be controversial, so I want to say right at the beginning that I voted to remain. Uh, everyone, of course, you may remember, will remember, everyone was shocked by the result, not least the leaders of the Leave campaign on television. They looked so miserable and uh, dumbfounded that it, they appeared to be the losers. Uh, possibly they were thinking, crikey, what have we done? Well, we know what they've done. Today I've got two main aims. I'll argue that uh, Britain's exit from the EU has been possible for 25 years and probable for about 10 years or so. It was only a matter of time and chance. And I'll explain the implications for the British constitution of joining and of Brexit. Historians uh, enjoy a gift that's denied to mere mortals. Uh, we have the benefit of hindsight and I'm going to use that uh, gift to the full. So bear with me if I briefly go back to the Second World War and more particularly to its aftermath. Britain is still rightly proud <clears throat> of her part in that catastrophic conflict. When uh, Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, Britain and France immediately declared war. After France collapsed in 1940, all of Western and Northern Europe had fallen or was to fall under Nazi domination. Britain defied him alone for more than a year. And when the United States was bombed into the war in December 1941, Churchill and President Roosevelt uh, developed what Churchill dubbed the special relationship between the two countries. Ever since then, British Prime Ministers have made much of that concept, not least, the latest, Theresa May. Victory in Europe in 1945 restored freedom, of course, to the previously subjugated Western European states. Britain was unbeaten, victorious, but she had paid a terrible price, not only in human loss, but in physical damage. And Britain was left more or less bankrupt. From the rubble of that war emerged, uh, especially in continental Europe, a determination that there should never again be such a disaster. In a sense, the first step came in 1952, when six countries created the European Coal and Steel Community. Doesn't that sound dull? <laughs> but iron and steel are the essentials of war making. Later they embarked on the much more important initiative to create the common market, formerly known as the European Economic Community. Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Italy, and astonishingly, in my view in many ways, France and West Germany all signed the Treaty of Rome in 1957. They were the original six. The preamble of that treaty famously committed them, and I quote, to lay the foundations of an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. But Britain remained aloof from all that. True, Britain had fully uh, joined in the steps to create NATO in 1949. She would played an important part in drafting the European Convention on Human Rights, which came to effect in 1953. But Britain was absent from the signing of the Treaty of Rome, as she was this March from its 60th birthday celebrations. Why didn't Britain join these developments, especially the common market, during the 1950s? The reasons are important to my argument, and I think there are three. <clears throat> First, Britain, for better or worse, considered herself to be different from, and to be blunt, superior to the continental countries. Britain had stood alone and undefeated in the war. The Western European countries, by contrast, had been crushed, despite, of course, their best efforts. After 1945, 
they had to resort to new methods to rebuild from, I suppose, greater damage that had been, in, that had been inflicted on Britain, uh, appalling though that was. The Conservative and Labour parties were as one in believing that just as Britain, with her allies, had won the war by her own exertions, so she would win the peace. Secondly, Britain has never been, had never been, uh, taking it back to the early 50s, mid 50s, had never been a European power, but a global one. The British Empire had been the greatest ever. In 1957, I checked these figures, the British Empire and Commonwealth still covered 20% of the surface of the earth and embraced over 30% of its population. There was trade preference between all Commonwealth countries, an arrangement that long predated the common market. To many Commonwealth states, Britain was the mother country, and to all of them, the Queen was head of the Commonwealth. Thirdly, Britain had this special relationship with the United States, created between Churchill and Roosevelt, and much valued on this side of the Atlantic, if perhaps, in truth, not so much on the other. And Britain possessed nuclear weapons, jointly developed with the United States during the war. This was seen by Britain as another mark of her superior status in the world, certainly in Western Europe, again, for better or worse. The political consensus in the 1950s, therefore, was that Britain's future should continue to embrace the whole world, not just the adjacent continent, through the Commonwealth, the Atlantic Alliance, and so on. But within four years of the inception of the EEC, Harold Macmillan's Conservative government decided that if the right terms could be agreed, Britain should, after all, join this new enterprise. How on earth did such a volte face come about so quickly? The reason was economic, not political, and certainly not constitutional. The British economy was faltering. The economies of the six were forging ahead. Macmillan's view was that on the right terms, especially if Commonwealth interests could be safeguarded, then joining the six could be economically advantageous. And so in 1961, Britain formally applied to join to see whether those terms could be obtained. The Labour Party immediately denounced that move. Indeed, its leader, Hugh Gateskill, was famously to say the following year that if Britain were to join the EC, it would be, quote, the end of a thousand years of history. Thus, please note this. There was no party consensus behind the first application to join by the then Conservative government. Now, Macmillan might have thought that France would help him. In 1958, France had called out of retirement Macmillan's old wartime colleague and indeed friend, the proud and rather prickly General Charles de Gaulle, to be president of the new Fifth French Republic. Back in 1940, the general had set up a French government in exile in London after the fall of France. But in 1963, the general, in the name of France, vetoed Macmillan's application. Macmillan never recovered politically. Labour won the 1964 general election. Under its new leader, Harold Wilson, however, Labour had changed its mind over the common market. In 1967, Wilson, as Prime Minister, toured the six to garner support for a fresh application. This time, the general moved much more quickly. And in November of the same year, he vetoed any such negotiations with the British. Why did the general thwart Britain's two attempts to join? One private reason undoubtedly was that he wanted France, and if necessary, I suppose he would think grudgingly, West Germany, to be the principal power or powers in the European community. He understandably saw Britain as a potential big threat to that. 
But publicly, he threw back in Britain's face the very reasons that she'd used in the first place to shun initial joining of the EEC. Britain, he declaimed, was not a truly European country. Britain traded within her own free trade area, the Commonwealth, with whom she still had worldwide uh, imperial links. And Britain was closely allied with the United States, was Atlanticist, which France most certainly was not. Indeed, the general had withdrawn France from NATO in 1966, and France had created her own nuclear arsenal. The general, despite what Britain and the United States had done for him personally during the war, taking him in, recognising him as the leader of the Free French and so on, he had a dislike of the Americans nonetheless, and the British, whom he was pleased to call the Anglo-Saxons. That was 1967. But of course, you know that just five years later, Britain did indeed become a full member of the EEC after a third and this time successful application. This was the personal triumph of the new Conservative Prime Minister, Edward Heath. Had the general thawed towards Britain? Non, pas du tout. <laughs> he had resigned in 1969 on unrelated matters, and his successor, Georges Pompidou, was as keen as Heath to enfold Britain into Europe. But this mutual regard was not shared by the Labour Party. It had changed its mind again. By the early 1970s, it was opposed again to joining. The Parliament had proved the deal narrowly, and the European Communities Act of 1972 made the UK a member of the European Communities from the 1st of January 1973. And so that was that, except that it wasn't. Wilson was back in power in 1974, but had yet again changed his mind. He now wanted to renegotiate Heath's terms with a view to remaining in the community. Wilson's government and party, however, rather like the country as a whole, was bitterly and deeply divided over EC membership. Indeed, about a third of his ministers wanted to get out of Europe before it was too late. So the Labour government put into its manifesto, two manifestos actually, a promise to settle the issue, as it turned out, by a referendum. Please note this. There had never before been a UK-wide referendum. It was a device unknown to the UK constitution. The Referendum Act of 1975 was passed, permitting an advisory <coughs> <coughs> referendum. In truth, Wilson's renegotiated terms were minor and cosmetic, but all ministers agreed to abide by the result. The question was, it's worth knowing this, quote, do you think that the United Kingdom should stay in the European community? And in case anybody didn't know what that was, in brackets, the common market, end of bracket, question mark. One vigorous campaigner for a yes vote was a future, uh, forgive me, the new leader of the Conservative Party, Margaret Thatcher. How ironic, given how her views developed in later years. The 75 referendum result reflected the split in Labour government. In June of 75, some 67% voted yes, 33% voted no on a 65% turnout. I voted yes, by the way. Where then stood Britain and her relationship with Europe in 1975? That vote had been conclusive. By a two to one margin, Britons had voted to stay in the European communion, community. Yeah, not the European communion. Now that, that would be, that would put the cat among the pigeons. The EU laying down one form of holy communion. No, no, I, I don't mean that. Um, by the way, although if they did away with the sign of the peace, I'd sign up immediately, but that is neither here nor there. I'm trying to speak of the European community, my apologies. My throat is going to my brain. Um, by a two to one margin, Britons had voted to stay in the European community. But behind that apparent finality, there are uncertainties still 
Notice first the arithmetic. I don't attach too much to this, but it's worth noting. Over a third of voters hadn't voted. Can't know what they thought. Contrast that, by the way, with the turnout in the recent Scottish independence referendum, 85%. You can't argue with that. Remember, secondly, that the two main political parties remained split internally. The 1975 vote had patched up the Labour government, and good luck to it, but many Labour supporters remained opposed to the community. Indeed, during the 1980s, Labour was once more to advocate withdrawal. It was to reverse itself yet again in the early 1990s. Is anyone keeping track of this number of U-turns? I've lost the total already. Um, and the Conservative Party still contained a significant number of fervent anti-Europeans. The referendum result could not bind up the conservative wounds that had been inflicted by joining the EC. Be clear thirdly, and this is important, that referendum had confirmed membership of a bloc whose primary purpose was economic. No one could have known in 1975 that that trading partnership, or whatever you want to call it, would develop into the European Union as we know it today. In brief, a significant number of entirely sensible Britons, reinforced, I grant you, by some who were idiotic, uh, remained much further away from the community than the, as it were, the narrowness of the English Channel might imply. <coughs> now, lawyers present might have a complaint. Uh, I've said very little about the law. It's your turn now. I'm going to correct that. The uncodified British Constitution is based on a famous concept, famous to lawyers anyway, of parliamentary sovereignty. That parliamentary sovereignty has existed since the so-called glorious revolution of 1688-89. What it means is this. The United Kingdom Parliament can make any law it likes about anything. It can also repeal or change any law it wishes. Once a draft bill, a law, a draft law, forgive me, once a draft law, a bill has passed both houses, commons and lords, and has received royal assent, it becomes an act of parliament or statute. There are thousands of them. Royal, royal assent reminds me of something that was said in my very kind introduction. Um, if you'll treat this with some discretion, I can tell you this, that given my links with Buckingham Palace, the Queen's opinion of Brexit is no more known to me than anybody else. <laughs> <coughs> Before accession, statutes constituted the supreme law of the land. No person or body other than Parliament could override a statute, not the courts, not the people, and certainly not any foreign legislature. While an act is in force, the courts must obey it. That's the essence of parliamentary sovereignty. Of course, Britain has treaty obligations which limit freedom of action in some respects. But treaties can't override parliamentary sovereignty. The most important treaties have to be uh, accepted, as it were, through a statute. And if Britain wants to leave a treaty, I'm not speaking of Europe for a moment, but generally, um, it can do so at any time by passing another statute. That is parliamentary sovereignty. Now, some said in the early 1970s that legislation to bring about British membership of the EC would require a bill of a thousand clauses. In fact, the European Communities Act 1972 has just 12. Section 2 is the crucial one. In crude summary, and please, my law colleagues, don't start shouting that I'm not giving a comprehensive view, I'm not attempting that, but just to get to the absolute core of the thing, it's this. First, Section 2 provided that all existing and future EU EC law Forgive me if I don't distinguish between the various kinds of EC law and other criticism which you can fairly make. All existing and future EC law was to have direct effect in Britain. No further parliamentary action would be needed to apply it. Secondly, it stated that all British statutes were to be read as being subject to that community law. How would that affect national and parliamentary sovereignty? <coughs> 
In its white paper at the time describing the terms for joining, the, the government said this, and I quote, there is no question of any erosion of essential national sovereignty. What is proposed is a sharing and an enlargement of individual national sovereignties in the general interest. That more or less was all that was said about parliamentary sovereignty in 1971-2. Only the top UK court, then the law lords, could state definitively what effect the 1972 Act had had on parliamentary sovereignty. People could speculate, politicians, academics and so on, but only the top court could give a, a ruling that would be binding and clear. It, in my view, it's astonishing that it took 20 years after accession for a relevant case to get before the law lords on this very point, this supremely important constitutional question. Who on earth would have predicted that the dispute of all things would have involved a disagreement about fish? But it was. The facts don't matter. The constitutionally vital case was called Factor Tain, decided in 1991. In essence, the law, the law lords applied a ruling in the case which they, they were required to obtain from the European Court of Justice. The law lords held that Section 2 of the 1972 Act imposed a major limitation on parliamentary sovereignty. They said that all member states, including, of course, Britain, must comply with EC law. If any or any part of a national law of whatever date, past, present, future, uh, was inconsistent with EC law, then it was, in the court's word, ineffective. In the simple language, it was void. The offending, or at least the, that part of the offending statute, what was it? The famous Merchant Shipping Act of 1988, known to everybody, was struck down. The, the part which was not consistent with EC law was held to be ineffective. Since 1973, parliamentary sovereignty had been subject to community law. As a member of the community, Britain could not pass any law that conflicted with EC law, which was supreme over English law. British newspapers, especially the tabloids, which I suppose count as newspapers, um, erupted in fury. So did many politicians, and indeed some ordinary Britons. A foreign, a foreign court had struck down, had demolished, a 300-year-old cornerstone of the British Constitution, parliamentary sovereignty. Britain was subject to, subservient to, community law. So she was no longer wholly independent. Now, explanations that this was because Parliament itself had voluntarily passed the EC Act of 1972, and that for a club to function, all the members must apply the same rules, satisfied some, but not all. Perhaps factual tain gave birth to, or at least vastly increased, Euroscepticism. A wish among some, indeed, to be free of Europe. Note that UKIP had its origins in 1991. It did not start life as UKIP, but within a short period developed into it. I turn now to <coughs> why leaving the EU has for Britain been, in my view, but a question of time and chance. And I begin with the wider world. The whole Western world has seen a collapse of trust, hasn't it? One after the other in institutions, in the established order, in major professions. Ordinary people no longer trust them as they used to. I think that this phenomenon contributed significantly to the Brexit vote. I suppose the most recent example of populism, or whatever it means, I mean that in a wholly neutral sense, uh, the most recent example of this, I suppose, was in France. Uh, the two traditional parties that had governed alternately the Fifth Republic, were humiliated uh, in favour of electing President Macron, whose party, even if it's a party, there seems to be some doubt about that, rather than a movement, has existed only for a year or so. 
He's committed to the EU, but I notice in the small print, he's committed to reform as well. And last year, staying with this theme, a man with no political experience was elected to the most powerful office in the world. Nor, unlike, say, President Eisenhower, did Donald Trump make up for this with military experience. He had avoided compulsory military service because of his feet. But this erosion, erosion of trust, not Trump's feet, this erosion of trust <laughs> had begun 10 years earlier with the banking crisis of 2007-8. One decade ago, in my view, the fuse was lit. In essence, big banks in the United States, later in Europe, use people's money as if banks were giant casinos. They amassed vast toxic debts. They lent money they didn't really have for mortgages that could never be repaid. The contagion reached this country in 2007. Indeed, investors, the main example, investors in the Northern Rock Bank uh, withdrew large sums, fearing that it was about to go bust. Being British, you can see, saw this on the television at the time, they formed orderly queues outside the branches, fortified by cups of tea. Who needs a statement of British values when you can actually see them in action? Patience and tea. It makes you proud to be British, in my view. <laughs> the banks held guns to government's heads. If, they said, you don't bail us out, we'll collapse, the whole financial and economic system will come down with us, what else could do but governments bail them out? With billions of pounds, disaster was avoided. But governments don't have their own money. They only have taxpayers and borrowed money. As a result, let's stay with Britain, British citizens were condemned to years of austerity. Citizens had not created that mess, but they had to, we had to pay for the wrongdoings of others through higher taxes and prices, and to this day, for many, very little by way of pay rises. British politicians were the next to fall from grace. In 2009, it emerged that many MPs, mostly within parliamentary rules, had claimed outrageous sums as expenses. A handful were convicted of fraud, a small number went to prison. This reinforced, in my view, the false assumption, and there it is, that they're in it for what they can get. <clears throat> it's hard to exaggerate the deleterious effect that this had on the public. Newspapers followed. Several had illegally hacked into private information, which they then splashed in headlines and stories to sell their rather grubby publications. Some journalists were convicted of offences. Late last year, an opinion poll, for what that might be worth, who has faith in opinion polls these days, but I pass this on for what it may be worth, uh, an opinion poll asked people to rank professions according to people's respect for them. Unsurprisingly, doctors and nurses came top, scoring over 90%. At the other end, estate agents actually improved their standing. <laughs> they got up to 30%, uh, an all-time record. Journalists became beneath them with 25%, but at the very bottom were politicians with 15%. Only 15% of people effectively said we have confidence in politicians. Faith in democracy had been corroded. All of that, I submit, must have contributed in part, unquantifiable, I grant you, to some voters lashing out at the whole political establishment and the government at the Brexit referendum. The elite urged a Remain vote. But some, perhaps many citizens, thought politicians, the government, the banks, most newspapers, urge us to stay in the EU. Well, given what they've done to us, I'm voting to leave. I believe that the EC, later the EU, in parallel with such developments, <clears throat> did a number of things that would unwittingly contribute to Brexit. And I'll mention four. This was not done with that purpose, of course not. And I'm not being judgmental, 
I'm not criticising anyone or doubting anyone's honesty or integrity. First, in 1957, the fathers of Europe adopted those famous words, ever closer union. Uh, separately, there's frequent use of the phrase the European project. I noticed it, by the way, in the Guardian editorial just a couple of weeks ago. What do those phrases mean? At one extreme, they could just imply easier commercial ties within a community or union. But at the other extreme, they could indicate a desire to develop a fully federal state of Europe, replacing the existing nation states. Indeed, such an outcome is the personal preference of the present president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. It's easy to see why those words would make a slightly nervous Britain suspicious. No one can tell him or her what ever closer union or the European project were leading up to. Indeed, to leap ahead, if I may, one of David Cameron's 2016 pre-referendum renegotiated terms was to ensure that ever closer union would no longer apply to Britain. Secondly, in my opinion, with the benefit of hindsight, it was a misjudgment in relation to the UK for the European community to restyle itself as the European Union, or at least to do so so soon. There are lots of constitutional unions around the globe, represented by fully federal states, Germany, Australia, Canada, the US, and so on. In federal systems, the top or federal layer of governance has its powers invariably over defense and foreign affairs and so on, while the regional or whatever you call units have their own defined powers. In a federation, the only state or country that's recognized as such by the rest of the world is the one at the federal level. The Treaty on European Union, the Maastricht Treaty of 1992, blew trumpets that could herald a federal Europe. It aims to have common policies on defense, security, and external relations at the federal level, as it were. Not that that word is used in that context. Indeed, it established a foreign minister to represent all EU states to the rest of the world. Every citizen of a member state um, is uh, an EU citizen. The treaty sets out a charter of fundamental rights of the EU. It provides for a common currency, the euro. Was the Maastricht Treaty welcomed in Britain? No, it wasn't. It was opposed by the Labour Party. Many Conservatives thought that it was a step too far. Some Conservative MPs, when called upon to vote on the relevant bill, voted against it, completely defying their whips and their government. Several votes on that Maastricht bill to give it effect in English law were carried with tiny commons majorities. John Major, by the way, had to say in relation to some votes that they were votes of confidence in the government. And if the votes had not been carried, there would have had to be a general election. Given that the Conservatives were so unpopular at the time, that would have been a disaster. So presumably some Conservative MPs held back. In my opinion, within Europe it was Maastricht that was the beginning of Brexit. The third indirect contribution to undermining British support for the EU was the adoption of the euro in 2002. Now, Britain had already burned her hands badly by joining the, e the euro's uh, precursor, the exchange rate mechanism. I don't pretend to understand what the ERM was, but I do know that in 1993, the Treasury spent, as it turned out, wasted billions of pounds trying to shore up British membership of the ERM against speculators. All to no avail. Britain crashed out of the ERM, John Major's government never really recovered, and itself crashed out of office at nine, uh, in 1997. Once bitten, etc., when the euro was subsequently launched, Britain opted out of it. But my objection to the euro isn't economic, about which I can speak no sense, really. My objection is constitutional. Its creation put economics before politics, 
it's been very unusual for two or more states to create a new common currency without first becoming a single constitutional unit. And so wouldn't uncertain people assume that the euro is a precursor to political union? The adoption of the title of the European Union and of the euro itself were two steps taken, in my view, too quickly in the evolution of... Well, in the evolution of what, exactly? That is my constitutional query. The final failing, and again, I attach no blame for this, was the EU's inability to make a collective and effective response to the Great Migration Emergency. Angela Merkel's open and humane welcome to so many migrants was, in a way, a shining light in a gloomy world. But as an organisation, the EU was unable to cope any more than could individual states, including Britain. In Britain, as elsewhere, EU freedom of movement was blamed for the consequences of that migration. And so for many years, many Britons were waiting for the chance to be heard, to do something about Europe. One man promised that chance. In 2013, Mr Cameron, as Prime Minister, was politically threatened over Europe from within his own party, by Eurosceptics, and from an increasingly popular UKIP. So he committed a future Conservative government to a, an in-out referendum. After the Conservatives won the last election, he duly renegotiated Britain's terms of membership. You remember what those terms were. No, neither do I. Uh, they, they were forgotten in the heat of the campaign, just as they had in Wilson's in 1975. Mr Cameron urged a Remain vote. Nonsense was spoken on both sides. You remember Project Fear, you remember all that. George Osborne, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, who at that time had only one job, threatened an emergency budget including a tuppence increase in income tax if the vote was to leave. The Bank of England, other expert institutions, forecast economic horrors outside the EU. Some leavers, on the other hand, promised that £350 million a week would become available to spend on the NHS. On the 23rd of June 2016, 52% voted to leave, 48% to remain on a 72% turnout. And then what happened? Well, the pound fell significantly, making imports more expensive. And our forthcoming Vienna holiday will cost us 15% more as a result. I'm afraid it's going to be the Vienna travel lodge for us. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing wrong with travel lodges, so I'm told. Um, but all this made exports cheaper. All other economic indicators, not least the stock market, went up. Faith in elite experts took yet another hit. David Cameron resigned the following day. As he went back into number 10, having made this announcement, he was humming a cheery tune. <laughs> Every cloud has a silver lining, I suppose. Mrs May became the new lead, Conservative leader and was appointed Prime Minister by the Queen on the 13th of July, 2016. Initially, the new government, you remember, decided that the famous Article 50 of the 1992 Treaty on European Union could be activated using executive powers under the royal prerogative. There was a case brought against that, the Miller case. The Supreme Court, in essence, held that a statute was essential. Such a statute was passed. After all, who in Parliament could oppose a statute to enable Brexit and be labelled an enemy of the people? On the 29th of March this year, the Prime Minister had a letter hand-delivered, not risking the uncertainties of Royal Mail, to the President of the European Council, triggering Article 50. After 44 years, Britain was dissolving her ties with the European project. I wonder whether in heaven, de Gaulle sought out a gloomy Macmillan to say something like, you see, mon cher Monsieur Macmillan, I was right all along. <laughs> I very much doubt it, because in de Gaulle's heaven there would be no Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> certainly, certainly in Macmillan's heaven there would be no de Gaulle. But the, these are theological matters into which I cannot trespass. 
The government has published its legislative proposals, and in brief, a great repeal bill will do three things. First, the 1970... This bill has not yet been published, but it will be, presumably, if the Conservatives are returned in the next few months. First, the 1972 Act will be repealed on the day that the UK, the UK forgive me, leaves the EU. So the 1972 Act will remain until the Great Repeal Act is passed, stating that that statute is repealed. Secondly, under the Great Repeal Act, all EU law that applies to Britain on that date will be translated into British statute law. Wait a minute. That's absurd. Isn't the whole point of Brexit to cleanse our system of EU law? Well, of course it is, and that will be done under the third purpose of the Great Repeal Act. After minute consideration of that vast mass of EU law, and only after that, will unwanted parts be expunged by further British legislation. Any parts of EU law that are wanted to be kept will be left in force. So no existing rules, rights or obligations will change when the Great Repeal Act is passed. Um, they will stay unless and until the British Parliament uh, alters them. Parliament will use its sovereignty to repeal the 1972 Act, to enact into British law e or EU law, and then by further uses of its sovereignty to repeal unwanted EU laws. I turn briefly to two points about the British Constitution after the UK has left. First, on the law. The Supreme Court in the Miller case has given its description of the legal constitutional situation. Subject to whatever the Great Reform Act might say, and of course they don't know that, we don't know that, on the UK's withdrawal from the EU, and I quote, EU law will cease to be a source of domestic law for the future. Decisions of the European Court of Justice will be of no more than persuasive authority. That is, not binding authority. And there will be no further references to that court from UK courts. Those legal rules derived from EU law and transposed into UK law by the Great Repeal Act will no longer be paramount, but will be open to repeal and amendment." Unquote. Parliament, in other words, will regain the absolute sovereignty that it enjoyed between 1689 and 1972. I should add, perhaps, for the caution, the separate European Convention on Human Rights will remain, will stay as part of our law under the Human Rights Act of 1998, unless something is done about that by the government. That's another tale. So, the UK's legal sovereignty will be restored. She can then seek free trade with anyone in the world, with the Commonwealth and with all of continental Europe. A special relationship with the US can continue to be nurtured. If all that rings a bell, it should. It's more or less where we were in the 1950s. Secondly, I'll speculate briefly about the UK in the light of the referendum vote. As Nicola Sturgeon keeps banging on, if I may say so, Scotland voted to remain. The First Minister demands another independence referendum to avoid Scotland being dragged out of the EU. In reply, Mrs May says, in my view, perfectly reasonably, now is not the time, especially that we've got the small matter of the general election to deal with. Legislation would be, have to be passed by the UK Parliament to permit such a referendum. So, perhaps it just stays there. But, but... No one can tell whether Scottish nationalism will uh, grow or wane. It is possible that one day uh, another referendum will take place and that Britain, that is England, Scotland, could be broken up. Northern Ireland, too, voted to remain in the EU. The main nationalist party, Sinn Féin, has demanded a further, uh, forgive me, a referendum to unite the North with the Republic of Ireland, which is, of course, an EU member. But only the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, the Cabinet Minister, has the legal power to trigger such a poll. He has rejected that demand. Again, though, a degree of caution is needed. Demographers tell us that the number of potential nationalist voters who 
would presumably vote to join the Republic as one Republic of Ireland, of the whole of the island. That number is increasing faster in Northern Ireland than potential Unionist voters. And so it's possible that one day Northern Ireland, no idea when, might vote to join the Republic and leave the United Kingdom. If that happened, uh, Northern Ireland would automatically become part of the EU. <coughs> I end, hooray, with three brief thoughts. First, the British say that they believe in fair play. They object to perceived unfairness and worse to wrongdoing. The miscreants I identified earlier, <coughs> especially financial institutions, the press, politicians, haven't yet rehabilitated themselves. Once lost, trust is obviously very hard to regain. That is taking a very long time. Secondly, should there ever be another UK-wide referendum? Each of the three such referendums so far, in 1975, in 2011, on whether the way in which MPs are elected should be reformed, and last year, were held primarily for party political purposes. I believe, difficult though it would be, that an objective test ought to be created which must be met before any future referendum could be held. In my view, parliamentary democracy mustn't be set aside in favour of a referendum just because a government sees an advantage in holding a referendum. Lastly, England has been a sovereign, independent state for nearly a thousand years. Down the centuries, <coughs> England, and since 1707, Great Britain, England and Scotland, has been an outward-looking global country. An empire has been built, later transformed into a worldwide commonwealth. Britain has fought two world wars. She helped create the UN, NATO, and the European Convention on human rights. Despite austerity, 0.7% of GDP is still guaranteed for international development and 2% for common Western defence. Perhaps Britain's 44-year institutional alliance with Europe just didn't fit with our island story. Brexit will restore the constitutional purity of parliamentary sovereignty. But I personally hope that we will not become a little England, but rather a greater Britain. A greater Britain that is a good neighbour. A greater Britain that's determined to cooperate with all, trade freely, develop all kinds of educational and cultural links abroad, including, of course, with Europe. Help the weak, oppose the wicked. The British Constitution is ready for Brexit, although the innumerable legal details will be hideously complicated. But the many, many broader consequences are unknowable. I suppose we can but hope for the best. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much for uh, a fascinating uh, talk. Um, it was uh, really uh, terrific. For those of you who might not know it, it, it only occurred to me this, this morning. Uh, Rodney has been a, um, uh, a servant of this uh, university for longer than Britain has been a member of the EU. <laughs> so uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his ability to reflect long term on that uh, uh, relationship is uh, in invaluable. And, uh, 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 we thank you uh, very much for that. We'll have uh, 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 half an hour for uh, questions and answers. Uh, there will be a microphone that uh, uh, um, uh, comes to you once you, uh, you raise your hand. And please uh, use it close to your mouth because we are uh, uh, recording this, uh, 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 this, this session. Perhaps uh, I can abuse my position and uh, start with a question myself as people uh, gather their own, uh, their own thoughts. And uh, one of the things that I found really uh, um, um, interesting in your... Um, uh, in your talk was uh, um, the British scepticism and problem with uncertainty, the idea of the ever closer union. 
how can we join something that we don't know uh, at the uh, at the end point? And uh, I wonder whether this kind of uh, aversion to uh, um, uh, uncertainty also creates politically and possibly even constitutionally a difficulty in consensus building. And uh, I'll try and be a bit more, more specific here. I was fascinated by how popular uh, Theresa May's uh, phrase Brexit means Brexit was with the public. Why was it so popular? Because it was certain. Huh? People, and again, uh, 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 listening to, uh, um, thinking of what you said earlier on, did not like a gray outcome out of this, right? They wanted to be certain. It's in or out. But of course, the world is more uh, complicated than this. And uh, um, in any event, 48% uh, of uh, people here voted uh, to stay in the EU. So there is a problem, it seems to me, with consensus building, which is something that uh, many political scientists have uh, uh, pointed uh, uh, when uh, studying the British Constitution. Uh, so I, I would like to hear your, um, uh, your view on this. Do you think that uh, there is a, um, a problem with how this country does consensus? both in its political uh, uh, dealings, but also in its constitutional order? Well, I think that necessarily, if I can take a, <coughs> excuse me, a constitutional point first, uh, the United Kingdom, unlike many continental European countries, usually, if I may put in that caution, has two big political parties opposed to each other, Conservative and Labour. They sit in the House of Commons opposite and against one another. There isn't the idea, as there is in necessarily because of their voting systems, about which constitutional reformers don't want to hear another word, I'm sure, um, they necessarily must, because they're forced, to go for some kind of consensus in order to govern. So there is that difference. Taking the referendum, a referendum being a binary exercise, that was another phrase that I was getting rather tired of hearing in the campaign, necessarily uh, forces people to take one view or the other. There isn't an in-between. You can't say yes provided this or no provided that. Um, I notice, if I may say so, and it just so happens the Liberal Democrats are making this point, that they want a second referendum once the terms of Brexit are known, um, because when people were voting to leave, they weren't necessarily, they were voting to leave the EU, but not necessarily things like the single market and the common help me, customs union. Thank you. My ignorance of these matters is embarrassing. Um, I personally don't buy that. Uh, I think that those voting to leave meant to leave and leave all these matters as a part of the European Union. But I, I do agree, I think the consensus building in Britain is constitutionally, politically difficult. Let me throw in one other point. There are coalitions, aren't there, around, the continent, around continental Europe. Coalitions in the United Kingdom are very rare. The 2010-2015 coalition was the first in peacetime since one was formed in 1931, which emerged into the great wartime coalition in the war. So there is that, certainly that difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if there are any uh, <coughs> questions. Can we uh, get the, uh, the microphone? Uh, Thank you. Uh, a, a legal question, really, about the, um, the uh, EU citizens, um, the stance that EU citizens, they want to be subject to European law <coughs> and under the European courts. Do you think this is a viable position? Is it coherent? Uh, forgive me, let me check that I've got your question right. When you say EU citizens, do you mean EU citizens other than within the United Kingdom? Oh, this, yes, this is, this is EU citizens who are living in the UK. Uh, and the, the negotiating position that is emerging is that all those EU citizens, they want to be subject to EU law and the EU courts. And so I ask the question, is that a coherent request? Does it make any sense legally? Uh, well, um, it, it could. It could make sense if, now of course this is all if and but and unknown, uh, 
But if it emerged that the final Brexit agreement meant that uh, EU citizens living in the United Kingdom, having been here for X years, uh, would have a right to remain, um, they would then be subject to UK law in all its aspects. Uh, they wouldn't, I think, be able to say, well, yes, I'm subject to ordinary UK law as an EU citizen from Italy, say, uh, but, oh, by the way, um, I, I want to embrace EU law as it was before Brexit. That, that's not sustainable. Um, the only linked but separate point that I would make is that once Brexit has gone through, assuming that the European Convention on Human Rights stays, and I must put in an, a big qualification, the Conservative Party has been promising for nearly 17 years to scrap this, leave that to one side, um, the European Convention on Human Rights would still apply to everybody in the United Kingdom, whether they were e a citizen of Italy living here or anyone else. I think that's the best I can do through speculation. Yes. Uh, just, just, just wait for the microphone to arrive. Just for one second. <coughs> uh, thank you. I. Um I always had a simplistic view about Article 50, and I, I simply thought that this Lisbon Treaty having come in, uh, it, it, it was part of English law, as, as you said. Um, Article 50 was the only way of going out. Nothing else needed to be done once, we'd, we, not once we had sent the letter. And, and, and the Great Reform Bill is, in my view, nonsense. What's your view about that? It's a little bit more difficult. I didn't go into the Miller case. And may, may I just say, in case anyone could bear to go over some of this stuff again, I, I will make available a much fuller version of these remarks, which people can read at the, in a couple of weeks. The Miller case was brought on that very point, more or less saying, as you say, that it, it being a treaty matter, the government makes treaties, the government can resign. Article 50, resignation from the European Union, was not known before Article 50. But there it is, black and white. On the face of it, the government says, it's a treaty matter. We, the government, using the royal prerogative, can sign this and leave. It does not require any vote in Parliament whatsoever. The complication which the Supreme Court in the Miller case found was this, that the 1972 European Communities Act incorporated into English law what we would know as statutory rights. Forgive me if I don't go into them, but there were a large number of them. And the court said, in essence, the government, by the stroke of a pen, cannot obliterate statutory rights. Only Parliament can remove statutory rights, regardless of their source, whether they happen to have come indirectly from European law via the European Communities Act or from a straightforward English statute. So the, the Miller case stopped dead the government's um, simplistic, if you like, view that we can simply sign and away we go. Um, in my personal view, once the High Court had made that decision, in very clear terms and very difficult to see that there could be a, a viable legal alternative, I think, if I may say so, the government wasted months bringing this appeal to the, to the Supreme Court. They might as well have got on with it, as everybody seems to be saying the government should get on with Brexit, which means Brexit. Can I just perhaps say, abuse my position w once more? I, I, will, uh, I will be very brief. Uh, and it goes back to this issue of uh, citizenship and also statutory rights, and uh, links back with uh, uh, some aspects of your uh, presentation, particularly how in the uh, run-up to the referendum, the uh, uh, immigration uh, uh, or the refugee crisis from Syria was conflated yes. uh, with uh, uh, um, EU freedom of movement. Mm. And how in all of that, the uh, whole notion of European citizenship was set aside. Right? Suddenly, uh, 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 somebody um, escaping uh, war from uh, Aleppo was treated in, 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 in the discourse here in exactly the same way as a um, doctor or a nurse from Spain coming to work here, exercising 
uh, effectively tell his uh, uh, um, uh, European uh, citizenship right. Do you think that there is, uh, uh, looking back now, that uh, this whole idea that Europeans who live here have citizenship and how that was have been communicated to the British public was very problematic and fed into this kind of populist? Narrative? Well, let's be careful. Who is a citizen of the EU? Answer, someone who is a citizen of an EU member state. Now, the problem, or at least a large part of the problem, has been that the migration has been from outside the EU. So uh, no one will say that simply because someone, let us say, from North Africa, who manages to get into an EU country, thereby becomes an EU citizen. In law, that can't be right, unless anyone wants to correct me on EU law. I'm always more than happy to be corrected. Um, so on that point, I think there was a distinction. If I may, I'll just mention one other point. Something that has gone completely um, out of consciousness was a well-accepted rule of international law, <clears throat> as far as I know, the EU law, that if someone comes to, uh, let us say, the, the European Union to claim asylum, then the duty on the claimant it, it was to claim asylum in the first safe country they can't come to, which might geographically, obviously, be Italy, Greece, wherever it might be. That notion seems to have gone completely out of the narrative so that people come to, let us say, Italy, wherever they've managed to get to, um, and then say, my ultimate goal is Paris or London. Now, if you cast your mind back 20 years, 30 years, this would have been treated almost with just one word. It would have been rejected on the grounds that if you got to Italy, a safe democracy, or Greece, wherever it happens to be, that is where you must make your claim in the courts. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that is no solution, of course, to the numbers who have come. That's one of the points I was trying to make. That because of the numbers involved, the EU institutionally, and certainly Britain, I'm not claiming any uh, special part for Britain, uh, has been completely incapable of trying to work out new systems, temporary systems perhaps, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so there was a, yes. Uh, thank you uh, very much for that interesting um, and entertaining lecture. Um, I just had a question about our so-called divorce bill. Um, when we leave the EU, I don't know if you know this, it surprised me there isn't a legal answer to the question, how much we owe the EU. Oh, there, there is a legal answer. Unfortunately, nobody's yet worked it out. <laughs> uh, I, if I may broaden that slightly, um, forgive me if I take 15 seconds. When I was at university, one of the many careers I played with was to become a parliamentary counsel. That is someone who writes parliamentary bills and deal with amendments and so on for the government. Uh, I was almost signing on the dotted line uh, until the first parliamentary council who was talking to me said, you're perfectly happy with the rota, aren't you? I had no idea what he meant by this. He said, the rota, as you know, is that uh, you will have to be in the House of Commons or the Lords as long as it sits, right through the night perhaps, to deal with amendments and give legal advice. I thought, blow that for a game of soldiers, that's not for me, <laughs> and I chose another career. Forgive me, this is relevant, because as we speak, there are government lawyers, not enough of them, they are in inducting uh, advice from private firms at great expense necessarily. These are hideously complicated questions. The best people available must be paid for it to decide what exactly the um, financial, among many other things, what the financial obligations are. Some people say nothing. Others say 100 billion. I really can't take it further than that. But in, there will be an answer in the agreement, assume there is an agreement, or there will be no answer because no deal is better than a bad deal. Cliché of the afternoon. I'm sorry that doesn't quite answer your question, though. That's the best I can do, I think. There was a question on the, on the back. Uh, thanks, Rodney, for a really illuminating talk. I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the, the, the nascent Great Repeal Bill. And, and, and you identified that um, 
the irony with this second element is that it's uh, the rather than being the, the great repeal, it's yes. the great incorporation yes. of, of EU law into domestic law. Uh, and obviously the irony comes from the fact that it, 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 it runs counter to the restoration of parliamentary democracy that seemed to be yes. uh, underpinning the, the, the uh, Leave campaign. Sure. But then, I, then the other ironic element is the third part of it, which is how uh, EU law would be subsequently removed from... Um, the domestic plane, and, and the proposal for that is through uh, Henry VIII powers, through government legislation. And again, that, that's problematic. How do you envisage a way which um, involves Parliament more and prevents the government from abusing an already controversial type of power? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, why is it called the Great Repeal Bill? Because it sounds good, and it's, it's, the, it's in the the whole weft and warp of Brexit, whether it actually ends up being called when it's published, the Great Repeal Act, who knows? It is, as you say, absurd in a way. But let's give credit where it's due. That mechanism is a very sound one of incorporating EU law as part of, as it were, British statute law as though the British Parliament down the years had enacted it. Because why? Because there will there'll be no more uncertainty on Brexit Day when the UK leaves about what rights and duties apply. The same EU rules, laws will apply because they will be in this uh, statute. So it, it, it is a silly name, I grant you. Um, but you can, you can see, I think, the very clever way of doing it. If I may just add one other point to that. Will poor old parliamentary council be told, oh, it's no good just saying in summary what I've just said. We want a schedule to this bill listing all of the EU laws that, you're, that are incorporated. Well, I think if I were parliamentary council, I would do away with myself if I were given that uh, uh, advice. Um, I don't for a minute think that it would be done that way. Prediction, it will bound to be wrong. My prediction is always wrong. I think rather they will use a general formula that will have the effect of incorporating. And then if you want to know what the, an EU right is on X, you'll need to go to the, the ordinary EU sources to find out. On the other point about repeal, um, just to broaden it slightly, the government has been rather more forthcoming. They say that there will be a number, they say about half, about half a dozen, bills dealing with discrete matters that will require statutes. The only example they've given that I know of is immigration. So there will be a full parliamentary bill sub alongside the Great Repeal Act. The Henry VIII point that you mentioned may not be understood by some people. What that means is this, that there will be a power in the Great Repeal Act that in essence says um, a minister can amend, repeal uh, any provision of any statute or however defined, it will be more closely defined than that perhaps, it will be more closely defined, by using subordinate legislation. All that that means is instead of having the change taken through Parliament, through innumerable votes, debates, uh, various stages and ditto in the Lords, rather there will be one debate, one vote in each House and out pops the uh, subordinate legislation to make the change. Um, it, you're right to watch it, and this has been criticised. Uh, opponents say this is not right, that the government should not be able, in a way, to supplant parliamentary sovereignty and, by the stroke of a pen, in, in practice, a meeting of the Privy Council, uh, the Queen again, with a number of government ministers nodding through these things when they've been approved once in each house. Um, but, but that's the way that it's to play out. But you're absolutely right. A close eye must be kept on that to ensure that the balance is right. Mm -hmm. There was a question down here. <coughs> I feel like I should burst into song. Thank you for that, Rodney. I, I have uh, a question that relates to couple of the mistakes you mentioned that you thought the, the Europeans made. Firstly, in the creation of the single currency. And whatever else were the objects in that, one of the objects was to attempt to create a currency that could rival the dollar as a unit of international exchange. 
And then the other, one of the other mistakes you mentioned was the creation of the union. And again, one of the reasons behind that, as I understand it, was to meet the objection raised by uh, American secretaries of state that they had no one to ring if they wanted to speak to Europe. I think that was the So how much of all this is just the Americans' fault? <laughs> <laughs> I would be astonished if when the powers that be in the European community, as was, thought, what would the Americans think of this? Uh, and therefore, we will do the opposite <laughs> or anything of the kind. Um, you're, you've helpfully reminded me that I have taken for granted, in case you think I'm a sort of closet Brexiteer just pretending that I want to be, I take for granted the enormous advantages that have flowed to Britain through membership of the European Union. I wouldn't have voted Remain unless I thought there were such. Um, I, I can only say that, of course, as far as the euro is concerned, as I understand it, much easier. For example, when uh, trading and so forth in one currency is much easier than six. 28, whatever the number of currencies were before the euro was invented. Um, I wouldn't have thought that America had any relevance, save that no doubt in the minds of some in the uh, august institutions of the European Union, that they thought, well, if we get this right, then the euro will be uh, a sort of uh, uh, competitor with the dollar. They rather shot themselves in the foot, if I may say so, by, and I think this is, forgive me, if, if, correct me if this is wrong, but as I understand it, Greece should never have been able to join the euro currency in the first place. But the figures are rather fudged, I don't know quite by whom, um, in order to make the euro as widely available as possible. And the members of the eurozone have paid a huge bill uh, bailing out uh, Greece. That's a rather patronising way of putting it. Um, of, of shoring up the Greek economy with money which, as I understand it, Greece may physically be unable to repay. Forgive me, I'm straying rather far from your question. Uh, there was another question down there. <coughs> Thank you very much for the, uh, for the lecture, Rodney. Very fascinating. A question about the, uh, the referendum debate. You suggested that a, uh, an objective test should be introduced yeah. in the future. How would that objective test look like? How, how should it look like? Should it look like the, uh, the lines of the European Union Act of 2011, joining an international organization? Would that be a significant matter? Or the, uh, the matter you suggested about 20 years ago, writing in the independent, saying, if a cabinet is split on significant constitutional affairs, then referendums are a sign of maturity. Did I say that? Yes. <laughs> in 1994. How, how, how fluent and convincing that was. Um, I have no memory of that whatsoever. I, I throw out this idea about an objective test as though it's something you could do tomorrow. It is terribly complicated. Why? Many other countries have referendums built into their constitutions. Uh, notably, for example, say France, um, if the text of the constitution is to be amended, there must be a referendum to approve it first. If the uh, result is no, the text stays as it is. Well, of course, the United Kingdom does not have such a text. Uh, so you can't adopt an objective uh, test for a referendum by reference to something that doesn't exist. Um, some years ago, a a committee of the House of Lords, a select committee on the Constitution, looked at this, recognised that problem, but still said there should be a test. And the test which they gave, I think very unhelpfully, and I don't mean that uncritically, uh, it's just that it is difficult to do, was to say, if the issue involves any of the following, then there must be a referendum. In other words, they, def they used it by defining 12 matters uh, about which there sh uh, concerning which there should be a referendum. From memory, I might be wrong, adoption of a new currency was one. Another was to re whether the monarchy should be replaced. Um, forgive me, I don't recall offhand the others. So that would be one way of doing it. Now, getting agreement on what those 12, 15, 6 items would be would not be easy. I don't pretend that it was a simple 
But what I do think is, uh, and may I make, I'm going to make a prediction with a health warning, all of my predictions are wrong. I think we will live a very long time before we see another UK-wide referendum. Um, I, I think a government is going to be very nervous about putting a question knowing that it loses control the moment that the, the ballot, uh, the polling station is open. Um, terribly difficult. But I do think we should try and work something out. Yeah. There was another question here. Um, thank you very much for a, a really great um, lecture. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I feel like I've, I've learned a lot in a very short space of time. Um, you've picked up on kind of trust as a theme throughout, or the, the lack of trust um, throughout your present kind of your, your lecture. And I suppose I want to pick up on this point. Um, it picks up on some of the points that have already been discussed. Of, you know, on that trust, the kind of lack of trust for politicians, but also the lack of trust of, among experts. Yes. As well, certainly in the referendum, you know, people, many people in this room, I'm sure, who did any media commentary got a, a hell of a, you know, kicking in some respects of being an expert. <laughs> so on that, um, where is this expertise going to come from for Brexit negotiations? Um, are we ready? You say we're constitutionally ready, but what about Whitehall? What about the civil service? And um, what about the Commons and the Lords? Um, and really, just to kind of pick on up that really about where is this expertise going to come from? Um, and also, how long is it going to take? Because we are going to be out by March, April 2019, but I imagine it will go beyond that. And how long is this Brexit going to take? Thank you. Well, if I may take that second point first, how long will it take? Uh, nobody knows. Two years is the period for negotiation. Uh, whether it can be done within that two years, we don't know. I should have added um, that um, the Great Repeal Act may not be as final as the Supreme Court said. You know, it's all over and done in one fell swoop. There may well be, and I know uh, leavers will shout violently against this, there may well have to be some transitional period, necessarily for various reasons. If I just to give one example, it may be unavoidable that for a limited period, the European Court of Justice retains its jurisdiction over a number of specified matters, simply because there's no other way of doing it. But it's terribly difficult in this to cast your mind, without being involved in all this stuff, um, to cast your mind forward in that way. Is Whitehall ready for this? The indicators that I get is that they are really treading water. Um, the Department for Exiting the European Union and the Department for International Trade admit that they haven't got enough people, civil servants, to do the job. They are still trying to get people in. Um, and indeed, the last cabinet secretary, the most senior civil servant since retired, Lord O'Donnell, has said that in his, his view, he wouldn't have done this, it this way at all in Whitehall. He would have created a unit within the cabinet office, one central place, so that all of these issues should be considered within the cabinet office and not break it up. If you think about it, break it up between the prime minister, who presumably be in there batting for Britain, or whatever euphemism the thing, cliche to use, uh, foreign secretary, uh, Brexit secretary, international trade secretary, secretary. Uh, I don't know, that was his view. But again, to, to answer your question directly, I am not sure that as we sit here today, uh, Britain does have, that is to say the government, has at its uh, hands sufficient expertise to deal with these very complicated matters. Um, I can see some uh, raised hands. I suggest that we take uh, three questions and then uh, at the end you can uh, uh, choose which ones or how you, uh, you answer them. I don't want to leave anyone co uh, co complaining. So uh, can we just uh, go back there, please? <laughs> Very interesting uh, presentation, uh, Professor Brazy. Thank, thank you. question I have is this, to round the alternative history. Uh, do you feel, you mentioned like, the lack of deference, the erosion of trust as sort of the reasons why it may have come about. I wonder if the issue that maybe the British public perceived that they'd been sold a pup, so to speak, from what was an economic union originally, 
through to it changing to a political union. And if, been, if the European had been a little more uh, elegant and open about it, about how they were making that transition, whether or not the outcome could have been different. And also, uh, do you feel that any lessons have been learned within Europe about how it's transpired with the UK or Great Britain versus how it may be applied to other existing European states in the future? Well, may I answer yeah. that? Because I, my memory being not quite as it was, I'll forget the, the drift. <clears throat> um, I think you're being a little censorious, if I may say so. I don't think that in 1957, forgive me, there were certainly some people who had this grand vision of a future Europe, but it was all pie in the sky. What I don't for a minute think is that secretly in Brussels, people have been thinking, we are going to get a fully federal Europe, a United States of Europe, a United States of Europe like the United States of America, and we're going gradually to weave our way around to get this. We sold it, as it were, as an economic unit. That's where we're going to go. I don't personally think that is true. Um, it, it has just happened in that way, that it has evolved from this purely economic thing to uh, a far more political unit. So I, I don't think the British have been sold a pup. I think that the, it, has, it has developed as it has developed. Um, from the start, as I was trying to explain, movement along that route from the United Kingdom was always going to be slower and rather more sceptical than, say, for some Europe, uh, continental European states. Yeah. Very briefly, if there are any uh, other... <coughs> yes, just a final one. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for a really interesting um, lecture today. Um, I have two questions I would like to pose. I think it's just, just more to One will be okay, just one. <laughs> okay, just one. <laughs> um, the general nature of British politics and the Constitution, because when I came as a student three years ago from Malaysia, um, what we have, taught, we, have, we have been taught is that um, the Constitution here is more stable. The um, nature of constitutional, sh constitutional change, the glorious revolution, everything has been piecemeal, the transfer of power from monarchy to the parliament. So I would like to ask a question whether as this nature change, um, whether it's more volatile now, because there's like the Scotland, the European Union, and um, the referendums are involved, and it seems to be changing every day. Whether the, the stable nature of constitutional change in this country, um, the British exceptionalism, I mean, is it still relevant today? Yes, certainly. There are two meanings of stable, I suppose. One is that, unlike so many other countries, as I was saying, England, purely through circumstance, has been an independent country for so long. By contrast with many other countries that have had civil wars or have been invaded or whatever it may be, to that extent there has been that stability and piecemeal development, sure. But you're absolutely right that since... Um, I suppose since the 1990s, there has been a great, because of, to put a label on it, the Labour government that came to power in 1997 did so with a vast list of constitutional changes that it wanted, and all of them, more or less, were put into place. Scotland, question mark, as you rightly say, Northern Ireland, for historically different reasons, but nevertheless, as I say, looking ahead, the possible poll, that is not as certain as it was, say, 40 years ago. Um, you're right. Uh, who knows in 30 years' time what the UK will look like and what its constitution will look like? Very difficult to say. We must wait and see. Let me just close this uh, fascinating uh, uh, session with a, a final, final question. And that uh, has to do with the, the politicization of courts uh, here. I mean, for us, students of uh, European politics, who have, of course, witnessed the uh, very vocal politicization of European courts, not least with the often uh, conflation of the European Court of Justice with the European Court of Human Rights and so on, by many uh, people in this uh, uh, country. More recently, yes. uh, 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 British courts have become uh, uh, heavily politicized uh, in the context of the uh, um, uh, Brexit uh, uh, debate. My question is this, uh, do you uh, fear that uh, somehow 
in this increasingly polarized nature of this uh, um, uh, uh, debate that uh, 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 the, the system of check and balances that exists in this country may come under strain? No. Um, you use the word politicization in relation to courts. If by that you mean that courts in this country have had to deal with political questions like Brexit, which are also, of course, legal questions, then that's absolutely right. But then they, have, they can do no other. If a legal question comes before them, that is, comes with heavy political baggage, they must give a decision. Now, to take the Miller case, the Supreme Court was very, very clear right from the start. Paragraph one, can't remember, but certainly in the early paragraphs, they were saying we are not concerned with the merits or otherwise of leaving the European Union. That is not for us, that is for Parliament. Our duty as the Supreme Court is to interpret and apply the law. Um, and I, I, I am confident that uh, that is not politicization in the sense that judges have become political. I, I don't, don't think that for one minute. Okay, um, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank all of you for coming uh, here today. I, thought, uh, uh, um, I hope you all learn uh, as much as I did. Uh, uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, our speaker for what I thought was an illuminating and fascinating uh, account. We were delighted you could make it, and uh, thank you very much again. Thank you very much. <laughs>